My name's Ben Alanak. I'm a professor of theoretical physics at the University of Cambridge. Um, and I'm, I used to work at CERN, and I still go out and work there a lot. So I work on their data, and I work on uh, mathematical models of particle physics uh, and, how, and forces and the early universe. And m my area of work is really between the data and theory, trying to inform one by the other and sort of bat things back and forwards. Um, and up until last year, I spent all my career work, working on the supersymmetry theory, which is a theory of uh, particle physics. And, uh, but we, we thought that the Large Hadron Collider experiment at CERN was going to produce particles predicted, new particles predicted by the supersymmetry theory, and it hasn't. They, this, this hope hasn't panned out. So I've kind of shifted what, uh, what I'm working on. But uh, the supersymmetry theory was beautiful to work on for a while. It, was, it had very lofty ideals. It, it, was a, it was a bridge to theories of everything, um, theory, like mathematical theories of all particles and forces, um, which tr tried to explain everything about our universe. So um, you know, dark matter, how forces work, what, what we're ma made of, um, you know, what light is, everything. Um, but you, the problem with them was you had to make quite a lot of assumptions um, to, to predict just a few things that you could measure and test in an experiment. And then we looked in the experiment and they weren't there. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so I had to rethink last year. Um, and now I'm working in a different mode. Um, I'm looking at the data and looking for glitches. Um, so we predict with the standard model of particle physics, that's the current knowledge that we have, uh, we predict how the data should look uh, from the collisions uh, between two protons at, uh, at CERN at high energies. Um, and we look for cases where the, the model disagrees, the prediction disagrees with what's, what's seen. Um, and then for the, that for me is an opportunity. So then we, uh, we jump on that and try and explain it, but explain it in a very simple way. We kind of just bung in an extra force or an extra particle that would explain the, what's seen. Um, and then we do some proper phenomenology. So we, we uh, try and suggest other ways in which it may be tested. We first of all check that it's consistent with all other data um, and then suggest other ways you can sieve the data to um, look for these new particles or forces. Um, and then, uh, you know, go one step further in the theoretical direction. So this is more we call it bottom-up um, science, working from the data and where you've got really solid foundation and you think you know what's going on, and then um, making hypotheses away from that. Um, so I'm enjoying this uh, new way of working. It's certainly quite different to the previous way where you try and solve everything um, and make loads of assumptions. That's That we call top-down, you know, it's like you start from pure th thought and then try and get to experimental uh, observations. Um, but for me, anyway, that, that, that approach hasn't panned out. So uh, you know, I'm trying a new approach and it's, uh, and it's a lot of fun. So this change in starting from the data rather than theory, does this mean that you've sort of given up hope of finding supersymmetrical particles? No. <laughs> okay, so is the work still focused on supersymmetry? Are you, that's just a belief you have, but you've kind of like... No, I, I, okay, so looking at my own work at the moment, the way, the way I answer this question is, the way for me to make progress right now is not to work on supersymmetry. And the reason is because we know from the data that the Large Hadron Collider has seen already, that in the next few years, there's not going to be a big discovery of super, supersymmetric particles. Otherwise, we would have seen small fluctuations in the data already. So in the next years, for me, that's not where the discovery is going to be. So I'm looking elsewhere. But still, you know, you can't help in your heart of hearts um, believe in this beautiful theory, which explains um, a really important fact um, that uh, we otherwise don't understand. And that fact is, um, why is the Higgs boson so light? So if you, if you do calculations on Higgs bosons, um, they're, they're affected by quantum fluctuations, the, little, the seething of space-time in terms of other particles. And they're, they're special in that they feel those fluctuations extremely sensitively. 
And if you do back of the en envelope calculations, those fluctuations should increase its mass by something like a billion, billion times more than, it, than it's been measured to be. So this, this is a puzzle that we don't understand with our current theory. It's not explained why is the Higgs boson so light and how is it able to stay so light with these quantum fluctuations. Um, supersymmetry explains this. It doesn't mean it's the only, that doesn't mean it's the only explanation, um, but the other ones don't work or, you know, we haven't really found a decent other one. So that's why we were so um, keen on, on it and why we thought we might be able to um, find supersymmetric particles as a signal that the theory was right at the Large Hadron Collider. So, you know, if in, uh, I don't know, five or 10 years time, some signals start appearing from the data, of course, I'm gonna jump back, right back on it, right? But uh, for the moment, I think in terms of progress, it's, it, it's more fruitful for me personally to, to look elsewhere. And why do you think there is this pull to sort of the grand theory of everything? Why has this been a focus in particle physics rather than starting from the data? I, well, I mean, the, the truth, you know, if I'm honest, the truth is that actually lots of different approaches are taken by everyone and it's a question of balance of how much you, you weight one thing against another and people work in different ways and so on. But um, the grand unified theories are ambitious. I mean, if you, could, if you could explain everything in one fell swoop, every, you know, not everything, it's not going dis, to, it's not going to explain how you fall in love, for instance, right? But everything about particle physics and perhaps even the early universe, that's a, a very tempting, um, seductive idea, right? Um, so that's partly it, but also just theoretical progress was made. Um, I mean, people didn't realize these grand unified theories could exist in the 60s, uh, 1960s. And then later on, you know, they, they sort of popped out of the theory. And so it was a theoretical playground where potentially you could explain everything all of a sudden. And so there's a lot of activity uh, on it. But um, looked for experimental signatures that they were correct. One of the main ones actually with grand unified theories was that um, protons, you know, the particles inside of atoms um, in the nuclei in the center, they should decay. Uh, and they set up this bonkers experiment in a mountain in Japan, uh, in the Kamioka mountain, where it's, they basically hollowed it out and filled it with water and put all of these um, detectors around the outside that measure light and they looked for protons decaying um, within this, within the water, basically. So you've got a lot of water. Um, so, you know, uh, if one of the protons decays, you can see it. So you can get very strong bounds on its, on protons lifetime, because there's so many protons in this, in this water. And the current bound on the lifetime is like um, roughly, it's got to be longer than 10 to the 32 years. That's much longer than the age of the universe. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's challenging the grand unified uh, theories and pushing them. And, you know, when you, when you don't have a good experimental um, signal that the theory is right, I mean, uh, you don't know where to go with it. You can do lots of theoretical work, but in the end, you don't really know whether your theory is right or not. And you've written that particle physics is in crisis. Is it to do with this uh, focus on theory? So I, I don't really... Um, I don't think that's the big crisis. I think there's a crisis in terms of the Higgs boson and this hierarchy problem. And the fact that supersymmetry doesn't seem to be right, and we, we don't understand why the Higgs boson's so light. I, I think in, in theoretical particle physics has a problem with that, and we don't understand it. And it may mean that we need to somehow shift paradigm. Maybe there's something going on with the Higgs mechanism, you know, the mechanism by which all the particles get their mass, subatomic particles get their mass. Um, yeah, but uh, so it may just be that there's a puzzle, we need a shift of perspective um, to really understand that. Um, but yeah, it may just be that. But I, I don't, I mean, I don't think that the whole subject is in crisis because we've been too theoretically driven because experiments are going on and there are people who work in various ways within that. Last century actually it was mainly, well, we had Einstein who, and Dirac, they were the big top-down uh, theoretical physicists, you know, inventing things from pure, 
pure thought and mathematics. And they had some very big, uh, impressive successes with that. But most of the other progress, from my point of view, in particle physics was either bottom up or came more from a batting uh, back and forwards, an interplay between theory and data. And so all of that continues at the, at the same time. Um, it's, it's more that I've just changed the way I'm working and hope to make more progress this, this new way. Yeah. And are there equivalent um, big names of physicists who use sort of bottom-up bottom up process that you've been inspired by in your own work, like comparable to Einstein, who is famous for top-down theory? I think the top-down theorists, I mean, they're very clever people. Um, they, get the, they get more of the big names, but there are certainly um, some good, you might call them phenomenologists, people who work uh, bottom bottom up. Bill Kane, for instance, and uh, some other physicists you probably won't won't have heard of as much. Um, and some some of the top down people also did bottom up. I mean, if, if you're sensible, you use everything you know available to you. I guess, um, yeah. And the work you're doing at CERN, con like uh, in regards to the Higgs boson, what sort of data are you using there, in more detail? Yeah. So um, at CERN. Protons are collided at extremely high energies. It's 14,000 um, billion electron volts worth of uh, energy in the beam. Uh, well, 13, actually, 13,000. And so um, they, what you do is you put uh, a detector around the point where you cross the counter-rotating beams. So these act like 3D, um, 3D cameras. And what comes out is a spray of a thousand fiery fragments. Um, and so what you're doing is detective work to kind of uh, go back in time, look at each collision, and try and work out what was going on right at the center, and which particles existed for a fleeting uh, you know, fraction of a second. So that's how the Higgs boson was discovered, actually. The discovery channel was when um, they decayed into two particles of hi highly energetic light. So you get two photons going more or less back to back particular energy. Um, so their energies add up to the mass of the Higgs boson. Okay, so it's through Einstein's equation e equals mc squared, you're turning the energy of the beams into the mass of the Higgs boson, which then goes into the energy of the light. Um, so that's, so um, you do various bits of detective work. So the, the Higgs, a particle which is very much like the standard model Higgs boson was um, discovered. But then you want to check, you know, does it behave in all the different ways like it's supposed to? Have we really got uh, a whole of the theory? Um, so it's as well as going into two particles of light, the chance of that is like one in 500. It just happens that it, it's easy to spot those ones. But it also decays in other ways. And so you check to see if the frequencies all um, are, agree with the theory. And so far, they pretty much look like the standard model has, has got it bang on. So we've got this dichotomy where the standard model is telling us that the experimental signatures of the Higgs boson all agree with its predictions. Uh, but then we use the theory to, set, to try and estimate the mass of the Higgs boson. And you get it right by, wrong by some huge factor. Um, so it's an interesting situation. Uh, to be in, yeah. And that was the thing, if we had supersymmetry, then we'd understand it all, um, but we don't. <laughs> and what would the ramifications be of uh, understanding why the Higgs boson is so light? Why is that sort of a, a barrier at the moment in theoretical physics? Well, the, the big, re I mean, we want to understand how particles act. We have this so the standard model of particle physics is a list of all the particles that have been discovered experimentally, including the forces. Um, and, uh, but it's a mathematical quantum field theory. It's a mathematical framework that tells you how they act. It can predict precisely for you what the frequencies of various things happening are when you do these collisions. Um, and if you just use that theory, it's, it's successful in nearly all ways, apart from this one way of pre predicting the Higgs mass. So it's like a chink in the armor of this whole machinery. Uh, and of course, chinks in the armor, if you can find out what's, why it's gone wrong, then you go through to the next stage, you make a big discovery, and we just find out more about the universe. So this is 
pure blue skies research. We just want to find out about the universe and the way it works. It's not particularly um, application driven. You know, you're doing a lot of um, turning mass into energy and, and vice versa. So there may be some hopes in the future for energy generation, but this is like way off. I mean, at the moment, we're just trying to find what's going on. Um, there's also work on um, proton therapy uh, going on, and it's basically accelerating protons using much, um, you know, very similar techniques that they use at CERN. And so there's R&D going on to, onto that, and it can be good for various deep type kinds of uh, tumors and so on for treating uh, those okay. things. How does that work? Well, you, you basically um, fire the proton beam into the body and it dumps all the energy at a certain depth. So when you've got very deep uh, tumors, it can be very damaging to the tumor, but not so damaging on the outside. So it, for certain kinds of cancer, it's, um, it's indicated, whereas other treatments, you know, it might damage the rest of the body too much. So it can be, can be more localized. So in certain cases, it's, uh, it's very useful. And there are, there are proton therapy treatment centers. There's, there's now one in the UK um, and there's another one being built, I think. Yeah, so it has all these spin-offs, um, you know, because it's, you're pushing technology further than it's been before. And of course there are uses for it. And so CERN's engaging uh, with medical physics, uh, and all sorts of things. So for example, CAT scans, uh, the, if, you, if you get CAT scanned uh, these days, the modern version of that was invented by the medical physics team in, in, in CERN, where it takes uh, x-rays and you know, uh, get, builds up a 3D picture um, at the same time. So yeah, there's, there's all sorts of good stuff kind of coming out of it. You know, it's uh, directly relevant to society. And are you hopeful that you'll uh, work out why the Higgs boson is so light? Yeah, always hopeful. <laughs> Never give up. Um, yeah, yeah. I've got no good ideas at the moment, um, but uh, we will see. At the moment, actually, I'm looking at other data. There, there are these particles called bottom meson mesons. Okay. And they're decaying with the wrong frequencies. So I think we've. I think there's a glitch in the data. So that's an opportunity for me. So um, we think there might be a new force who's, which is breaking up these bottom mesons with the wrong frequencies. Um, and so, yeah, we're proposing ways of testing that theory at the moment. So this is this bottom up way of working, just found a glitch, proposed something which doesn't necessarily explain anything else, but just to explain this data. But then now we're starting to ask, well, what does that mean? You know, if, if it, there really is this new force, how, what else can it explain? Um, and so we're starting to build a theoretical framework around it. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Exciting, yeah. yeah. It's exciting. Hopefully you'll have next time you come to this festival, we can hear. It might take a few years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one last question. We're at an uh, Arts and Ideas Festival. I wondered if there's any uh, films or music that has like, inspired your own work growing up or has had an influence on you? Uh, well, um, I mean, I, like many of my colleagues, I was a science fiction fan uh, when I grew up. So um, I used to read a lot of Isaac Asimov. Um, and I don't know, I, I was always interested in, uh, in astronomy and in planets and stars when I was a kid. So I read loads on that. What else? It's, it's like the other way around. At the moment, my, I, I, I draw, I do live drawings and um, so and I go to a life drawing class straight after work. So I go to this class and I've always got physics in my head when I'm, when I'm drawing. So it's come out <laughs> in the drawing. So it's like the other way around for me. Um, so I had this, I had an exhibition last year and did this, um, it's called Quantum Cells. And there's lots of kind of layered uh, images and there's obvious uh, parallels with quantum physics and superposition and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's like my science has inspired the art a bit. <laughs> wow, yeah. cool. So that's been a lot of fun. You should set up like a life drawing class at CERN. I've done, I did, yeah, a life drawing class at CERN. That's a great idea, actually. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.